Hi, I'm Beth Dean, CEO of Cure Epilepsy. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Brian Litt about the impact his Cure Epilepsy grant awarded in 2011 continues to have on accelerating science to create tangible benefits for people living with epilepsy. Dr. Litt is the Professor of Neurology and Bioengineering and Director for the Center of Neuroengineering and Therapeutics at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Litt. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. So, Brian, what was your CURE grant looking to achieve? What, what were you trying to accomplish? Well, there was really a lot of excitement at the time in developing new in high-resolution implantable devices to be able to map brain networks you know, at much higher resolution. It turns out that the electrodes and technologies that were used to map people's brains for epilepsy surgery were really developed sort of in the 1960s and 70s. They were, were recording brain at centimeter scale resolution, even though neurons are on the scale of microns and cortical columns like 50 microns. And so the technologies we were using at the time um, were ones that were limited by the technologies of the 70s and even earlier. So we were trying to develop new generations of devices that would map the brain at high resolution, the algorithms to go with them, and really trying to understand networks better to make epilepsy surgery better, less invasive, more accurate, better outcomes. And, and what did you discover? What, what did you find or achieve through well, your research? Well, I mean, there's been an explosion of activity in the field that we were a part of at that time, and it's continued. So a number of things. So the first thing is we helped develop a new generation of materials and implantable devices that have continued to evolve since that time. They record down to sub-millimeter resolution. They generate huge amounts of data which go up to the cloud and in data platforms that aggregate and analyze data. And new techniques um, that are used to map epileptic networks. I mean, the biggest things that we achieved were first uh, a series of research papers in very high profile journals like Science Translational Medicine and uh, Nature Neuroscience and places like that which showed some of our findings of brain networks at high resolution and that seizures actually, when recorded at high resolution, have a lot in common with cardiac arrhythmias, with spiral waves and things like that, which has evolved in our knowledge since that time. But probably the biggest thing that we accomplished was really spawning a generation of new scientists who have been continuing this work. And I'll give you an example. So Flavia Vitali, for example, is someone who was a postdoc who picked up some of this research and is now a tenure track neuroscientist building new um, devices and actually funded by Cure um, for her work later on. Jonathan Viventi, also funded by Cure, came out of this work and is a professor at Duke. Um, Duigu Kazum, another uh, postdoc who worked on this project, is now a, a faculty member at UCSD, developing new transparent graphene-related devices. And maybe most important of all, a wonderful scientist, material scientist, John Rogers, who's won a MacArthur Award and the Lemuelson Prize and the Franklin Medal and all sorts of things like that, began to turn his work not just from material science, but to biology. And at Northwestern, he's generated a bunch of new uh, implantable, flexible, and interesting, dissolvable devices, some with us, some with many other people. So I think that this grant not only touched basic science, but it helped establish a generation of investigators in a field that is grown dramatically. The return on investment, the amplification of this investment has been absolutely huge. That's wonderful. And, and um, as somebody with Cure Epilepsy, I love hearing that grants that we funded um, essentially multiplied and, and has helped um, cultivate more researchers within epilepsy. That's, that's one of our goals. So it's wonderful that that has occurred as well. 
I'll say also that, you know, these new devices also spawned a new kind of revolution in informatics related to how do you deal with the data coming off of these devices? Can you do and analyze it in real time? Can you, how do you deal with terabytes of data that are coming off of high resolution devices? And so our group and others have built data platforms. We had a startup company called Blackfin and now an open source platform called Pensive that lives out of Penn that is sharing and helping investigators deal with these large amounts of data in the cloud. Um, and it's actually propelled my own research, you know, even to a Pioneer Award that I received from the NIH last year to work on next generation implantable devices and closing the loop between the information coming off the brain and people's behavior and their seizures. So it was absolutely pivotal in my career and I think uh, has had a lot of impact. You know, the return on investment, you know, for that grant has been tens of millions of dollars. That's fantastic. Um, we love to hear that. So can you tell me a little more about the implications of this research? And, and uh, obviously there are kind of several um, uh, tentacles to it. So so what are some of the things, the implications or, or tangible things that patients with epilepsy may see either now or down the road? Sure. So so I think the first thing is, in terms of real tangible things, there are new uh, implantable devices that are being used for epilepsy. Jonathan Viventi, one of the people who worked on um, this grant um, long ago as a postdoc, um, now has a startup company you know, with licensed devices that where you can now record from the brain at high resolution. And there are a number of other companies that have technologies like that um, that are available both for laboratory work, but also for human work. So I, I think that's, that's a major tangible result of this work. I think the other thing that's happened is that looking at the data that's come off of these high resolution recording, both with these devices and then other things, the work of other complementary scientists like Catherine Siobhan at Columbia and others, is that we realize that epilepsy comes from brain networks, you know, areas of the brain and smaller, higher resolution regions that talk to each other. And they've really helped be part of the story to enable minimally invasive epilepsy surgery. What do I mean by that? Well, it used to be when I was training that if you had bad epilepsy, you'd have a large craniotomy and you'd have a big sheet of electrodes placed in the brain, you know, with considerable pain and morbidity, although, uh, you know, usually quite safe, and then have a large resection with side effects, you know, that might be cognitive dysfunction or psychiatric side effects and sequela. Fast forward now, you know, 25, 30 years later, and what we see is patients that get high resolution imaging, they'll get a series of stereo EEG electrodes placed in through very small holes in the skull under MRI guidance mapping these networks, and then many patients go on to just a focal laser ablation, where they come in the hospital, have a small hole drilled under the MRI, they may have a region of the network ablated, and then go home the very next morning. So the work we've done isn't responsible for that revolution in epilepsy surgery or care, but it's helped contribute to the knowledge base and this idea that at some point, epilepsy surgery may look very different even than now. Then picture like cardiac electrophysiology where a patient with heart arrhythmias may go into a single session where they're anesthetized, where the heart is mapped, and then an ablation is done right there at a single setting. And I think that's kind of the future that I envision for people with epilepsy rather than a long evaluation that goes on over months and several implants and things like that. So I think we're getting less invasive, more accurate, and I hope more effective over time. 
It's wonderful. I, I know from reading um, up on some of your papers and grant outputs, um, I was fascinated by the dissolvable technology that you could put in um, wires and then not have to go back in and take them out. I think that's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, an interim step between where we are now and where we hope to be 50 years in the future is that we know now that when patients have their seizures mapped in the hospital for surgery, that the recordings that we get over a period of just a week don't necessarily represent well what happens in real life. And so it may be that patients will, in the not too distant future, go home with recording devices with electrodes that are implanted in the brain. And, you know, it would be nice if they didn't have to go in for a second surgery to have them removed, but that they could just be programmed to dissolve away. And I think that's very possible with some of the work that we've done. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the work that you've done and for being such a, a wonderful champion and supporter of Cure Epilepsy. We're, we're grateful for what you've done. It's such a pleasure. And I can't tell you how grateful I am. You, you all have really helped make my career and those of a lot of other, you know, great people. So thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Litt for sharing his insights on advancements in science because of his Cure Epilepsy grant. To learn more about our grants and discoveries, please visit us at cureepilepsy.org.